The power supply spec that we use in basically every computer these days is from 1995, at least for the cabling. And there's been some effort to move over to ATX12VO, which is this one. This 10 pin does pretty close to the same thing functionally as the old 24 pin. But it's really been slow to pick up, even though Intel wrote the spec for both of these and it wrote the 12VO spec some time ago. Intel's vision for the future, along with a lot of the industry, is a future where the power supply only does 12 volts or 12VO, 12 volts only, as opposed to everything else that a standard today power supply in most PCs would use. So 3.3 volts, 5 volts, negative 12 volts, all of that goes away, but it still has to be addressed because components still use it, so all of it shifts to the motherboard. This topic we've talked about a few times, but now we finally have some components here, like this 12VO motherboard, which if you're used to PC building with a 24 pin, starts to look kind of crazy. But today we're going to talk about whether this is going to become a reality and provide some stronger fundamentals on the basics of what this might mean for PC building. Because again, we've got stuff like this FSP 12VO power supply. There's a Corsair prototype, well, pretty close to final 12VO one here. We've got the MSI board and there's some stuff to talk about now. Before that, this video is brought to you by Linode, cloud computing from Akamai, our web hosting provider that we've been using for over a decade now. In our experience as a long-term customer of Linode, they have reliable server solutions and make server setup easy by providing all kinds of first install scripts and launch points. You can quickly build your own self-hosted VPN, game servers for CSGO, Minecraft, and more by using their quick start guides and extremely detailed documentation. We also have first-hand experience with their support team and can vouch for the quality, even when all the mistakes were mine. Visit linode.com slash gamersnexus to get a $100 credit when you sign up today or click the link below. So even though an ATX 12 volt only power supply doesn't provide the other voltages, the PC still needs them. It needs them for things like, for example, PCIe, where this PCIe riser, we've actually split out the different voltage rails on this. That's for monitoring specifically for our testing, where there's 12 volt lines that are split apart. We've got 3.3 and we've got five volt lines. And each of these sort of clusters of wires is a different voltage for the most part. And that's something that still has to be provided for the computer. It's just not done by the power supply anymore. And that means it moves to the motherboard where under the ATX 12 VO standard and specification, all of those other voltages are handled here. So there have to be dedicated VRMs where you see clusters like this or over here that may handle uh, the other voltage conversions, even these small four pin connectors on the board, that's for a cable, something like this for SATA, where SATA SSDs uh, are not 12VO. And so you now move this cable from the power supply, where it is typically with 12 volt ATX 12V, uh, to the motherboard. It gets kind of weird, but that's how they're doing it. It feels more like an OEM system. Another couple examples too of Things that aren't 12 volt only, a lot of LEDs involve 5 volt headers. Uh, optical drives is another example that's less common these days. And if we look at like the mod mat as well, not intended as a plug, but it certainly uh, is useful for this. And you can grab one on store.gamersnexus.net, so I'll plug it anyway. But you see like a Molex connector here on the mat with the pinout has 5 volts. The old 24 pin, it's got 5 volts, these three here. We've got minus 12, there's a 3.3. And uh, then for RGB connections, some of those are five volts also, but a lot of other stuff is 12 volts already. So it's not too big of a jump for the CPU or for the GPU. It's actually not a jump at all. So we have an existing article and video on the topic if you want a deep dive of what the spec is exactly. But for the basics, this becomes a loop where you either convert those voltages on the board or in the power supply. So shifting it between one or the other feels like it's sort of a pointless shirking of responsibility by the power supply and pushing it onto the board vendors. But moving these conversions to the board is, according to Intel, better for lower overall power draw when the PC is in a low power state or especially in standby mode. And if you think of a small overall uplift in standby multiplied across hundreds of computers in an office building or maybe tens of millions of computers in large metropolitan areas, it actually does start to add up pretty fast. So where these small efficiency benefits for a single consumer are functionally irrelevant, they won't really uh, 
change how much you pay in power bills. Uh, certainly, it's more wasteful to just get rid of your current good power supply and swap it only because of a spec change, although you can do adapters that we'll talk about. But where it's irrelevant there, it is actually useful at a large scale. So there's some sense to it. And coming back to that topic, one of the early concerns we saw from our audience, from you all, with 12VO was that it would potentially nullify perfectly good power supplies, high-end stuff, or anything that may have another decade of life as long as the cables don't change suddenly becomes suspect as to whether you can continue using it if 12V over catches on. But it hasn't yet. It's been years now and it hasn't gotten anywhere. It's just the furthest we've gone is like one random one-off motherboard from MSI with no VRM heat sinks and a couple of power supplies out there. So it's not like a fast moving change, but when or if it ever does switch over, tables like this are what will resolve it. Where uh, you can potentially adapt to existing power supplies or convert a 24 pin into a 10 pin 12VO connector. So since ATX 12V power supplies already make 12 volts, it would be possible theoretically to use one to power an ATX 12VO motherboard, except for one problem, which is standby voltage. In traditional power supplies, there's a separate five volt rail called five volts standby or five VSB. In 12VO, that's replaced by 12VSB. Even with a custom pinned cable, that one change actually makes the two standards functionally incompatible unless you also convert the 5VSB to 12VSB. And Corsair has this adapter cable for doing exactly that. There are a lot of empty pins on the power supply side of the cable that correspond to all the voltages that ATX 12VO drops and some grounds. This goes from any type 4 pin out Corsair power supply with the company's standard 18 pin and 10 pin motherboard connectors to an ATX 12VO 10 pin motherboard connector. There's actually an inline circuit in these and we're gonna cut this one open to see what actually it looks like. So here's the inline converter and that's what's doing all of the really important lifting of just converting 5VSB to 12VSB so that the computer can actually function. And we'll take the uh, cheap be quiet knife that they sent us to cut open the Corsair cable and check it out. So there's some heat shrink uh, on the PCB. All right. Okay, so there's the PCB. It's actually kind of a lot going on in here. I mean, this is a large chunk to just include in line. Nothing really on the back side except for the solder joints. And on the top side, uh, there's a in fairly large inductor. There's some filtering capacitors. And if we get a close up, you'll see that up top with the purple sleeving near the inductor, there's uh, labeling for five volt standby. There's an accompanying ground next to it. And then the yellow line is 12 volts. And then the other side with the purple sleeving, it's 12 volt standby and then ground for the accompanying wire. So this is, in fact, where the conversion is happening. And this is what allows you to make a 12 volt power supply basically turn into 12 VO, kind of. Basically, this is the answer to the concern of if motherboards start to go for 10 pins and 12 VO, but people don't want to replace their perfectly good 10 year warranty power supplies, that's how you kind of bridge the gap. Uh, ideally, this ends up closer to the power supply to be better for cable management, but Otherwise, uh, despite being bulky, it's a solution. So to give you a preview in case this ever takes off for the PC DIY scene of what this standard looks like, we have three power supplies here. We have a very small, small form factor FSP power supply. This is 12VO. And actually, we'll just do a quick zoom in on the label here. Normally, these labels are filled with all kinds of information for the other voltages, but it's pretty simple. You've got 12 volts standby and 12 volts, and that's it. So this is one. Now, these are not to be confused with the sort of imposter 12VO power supplies you see in pre-builds, where Dell and HP, uh, for their consumer division, a lot of the times they'll take their server power supplies that are only 12 volts, but are not 12VO, confusingly. And so you end up with that 10-pin connector, but it's pinned differently. And uh, it might not even fit at all because the actual keying of the connector is different. The next power supply we have is this Corsair unit. And this is an RM850, but you can see that it is a PVT sample. We'll talk about that in a second. So this is an 850 watt power supply. We have another one here. This is also an RM850, and uh, it is not marked as a PVT sample. 
and you can see the PBT came in this not retail product box. So let's get started with these. The only obvious differences between them, aside from the stickers and the printing, are the main motherboard connector and the type of 12-pin PCIe cable and header. This unit without a printed sticker is handmarked as a production validation test unit, or PVT. This is basically the last step before the retail product, and all features should match retail. It has a 10-pin motherboard connector, as you would expect, and a PCIe power cable with a microfit 12-pin, like what's used on the RTX 30 series FE cards. The power supply side terminates into a regular-sized mini-fit 12-pin. Otherwise, this looks like a normal power supply. The unit with the printed sticker actually has real packaging, but it lacks printing around the connectors. It has an access hole for adjusting what's probably a variable resistor, but we're not sure exactly what function it serves. Instead of having a 10-pin on the power supply side, this one has a 12-pin for the motherboard cable. We don't know why Corsair chose to do it this way, but on the board side of the cable, there are two wires doubled up on pin 2 and pin 6, or ground and power OK, respectively. This power supply has a newer 12 plus 4 pin 12 volt high power cable and it terminates into a 16 pin on the power supply. It's interesting to see since we know that Corsair ultimately decided to do this as two standard 8 pins instead. It's likely both solutions are adequate, but doing two separate 8 pins allows Corsair to keep wider compatibility. It also came with this clearly custom cable. On the power supply side, it goes into the main motherboard 12 pin header, but the motherboard side is a 24 pin. It's just missing a lot of those pins. We traced this out and it's missing the 5 volt and the 3.3 volt that would normally be in an ATX 12 volt non-O 24 pin. And this is a 12 VO power supply, so that makes sense. We think this might have been for a custom test board, especially since it's got these probe points connected to the back side of two terminals. Also, the yellow wire is tagged as IPSU, which is a new signaling pin added to the ATX 12VO standard. And the last 12V only power supply that we have right now is this tiny FSP SFX unit. So this is the one that is rated for 750 watts max. And on the power supply side, the motherboard connector is a 12 pin right there. Uh, and there's no dedicated 12 volt high power on this one. It's pretty simple. This makes sense for a mini ITX build, um, but otherwise there's really not a lot of cabling on it, not a lot of features, not a lot of PCIe connectivity. It's a pretty basic power supply that clearly the main point is small. And that's kind of it. This is where we get into some of the confusing sort of wannabe standards where clearly on the 12 VO spec, it takes a lot less room. The surface area, generally speaking, of the 10 pin is much smaller. They've got a six over here still smaller and that's kind of somewhat optional but uh, we'll talk about that in a minute so much smaller footprint and a lot fewer wires to deal with in the cable itself of course but because 10 pin connections exist again in oem builds from companies like dell and hp you have to be careful about mixing and matching those because if the keying happens to be the same or you force it to fit which is basically always a bad sign with a power cable uh, you could definitely end up killing components because you might be crossing 12 volts to ground or something like that. Uh, if it even is 12 VO, the power supply you're pulling from an OEM system, it just happens to have a 10 pin. So you have to be careful about that already being kind of on the market, but not being the 12 VO spec. It's very confusing that way. So back to the 24 pin standard, this is again the pinout for it. And you can see this only has uh, two 12 volts right here. And it's got all the required voltages for the PC, so 5 and everything else that you lack in 12VO. But with only two 12-volt connectors, this can technically only provide up to 192 watts of 12 volts, assuming the power supply and the cables can do 8 amps per pin. And considering the most power-hungry things in computers uh, run mostly 12 volts, that's not a lot of power. But the main difference here is those power-hungry things are either going to be fed their power through multiple or one of these eight pins for the CPU, so it's a different cable entirely, or through the PCIe cables for the GPU. But the new 10 pin 12VO connector can handle a lot more power to the board directly, which opens up some interesting possibilities as long as the rest of the computer is designed around it. So here's that pinout for 12VO. It's got none of those other voltages and it has one more 12 volt connection than the 24 pin, making up for a total of 288 watts of 12 volt power. Aside from that, pin one is for turning the power supply on, 
pin 6 is for power OK, and pin 7 is the 12 VSB that replaced 5 VSB. Pin 5 calls for its own discussion, though. So pin 5 is pretty interesting. It's new to the 12 VO spec, and it's required going forward. It's specifically for I underscore PSU percent. And as for what that means, the spec defines it as this, quote, IPSU percent is a signal coming from the power supply that reports the proportionality of power being delivered by the 12 volt DC rail with the output load rating of the power supply. This is represented as a unitless percentage of the total capacity using a current mode. If multiple 12 volt DC rails are implemented, for example, 12 volt one DC and 12 volt two DC, then IPSU percent must report the utilization ratio of the combined total capacity. So to distill the spec jargon, basically, uh, this is to allow for brief overpower conditions to be reported back. So it's a useful function. It's actually kind of helpful and good for the, the PC in general. But ironically, the IPSU percent signal is sent out as a 3.3 volt signal, despite being 12 VO otherwise for the power supply. And it sends the, that signal to the motherboard in 10 microamp st uh, steps, which then uh, maps to 1% utilization per step on a scale of 0 to 200% for total power utilization of, uh, of the system. So again, you get back to brief overpower situations being reported. That doesn't mean that all ATX12VO power supplies are required to deliver up to 200% of rated capacity. It's just the reporting range. In our own power supply reviews in the past, we've seen that they run closer to 130 to 134% prior to overpower protection. Extremely short power excursions of up to 110 microseconds at 200% capacity are required on power supplies of 450 watts or greater capacity per this spec. And using the IPSU percent signal allows for reduced power excursion requirements in the power supply. The intent is for the PC to be able to use the signal as a sign that it needs to quickly throttle down in order to not hurt the power supply or shut down due to tripping the PSUs overcurrent or overpower protection. Now you don't want to run outside of the power supply's performance envelope regardless, but overpower situations, typically the way they work right now in ATX 12 volts is either you trip overcurrent protection, maybe you trip overpower protection, but if there's anything uh, that triggers when you go overpower, it's going to be one of those protections. Maybe the GPU is pulling too much current specifically or the whole system is, but either way, the result is it's off and that's how it works. With this IPSU percent thing, theoretically, the system will be able to throttle on power and be able to keep itself online or prevent some kind of massive failure uh, if the power supply is otherwise typically insufficient in order to protect the components on the other side. So that's where this is beneficial. And if this becomes more popular and interesting enough, it's possible that there's an ATX 12 volt specification revision where they go to a new version and they add IPSU percent to a more standard 24 pin layout power supply, uh, which could cause a ton of confusion in the market if people suddenly have their systems throttling performance and they don't know why. It might be because they're going over power, uh, maybe they spec improperly and they're pulling an extra 100 watts beyond what's intended. Something like that will cause, rather than just a hard shutdown, a new type of throttling. It might be misconstrued as thermal throttling or something to that effect. There is one other way that power supplies handle going over power, and it's a different type of protection. It looks something like this. <laughs> but the new approach is more graceful than the power supply exploding, although much less interesting from a footage and future memeing standpoint. So this is what a real ATX 12VO motherboard looks like. This is the MSI Pro H610M 12VO. Uh, this is one of the only ones on the market right now. There's no VRM heat sinks. It's H610, so can't overclock or anything like that. Uh, and as for the power pinout, it's the part that actually matters. We detailed it earlier, but you can see how much smaller the footprint is. Technically, if the board is low power enough, this one, this 10 pin, is all it needs to have to meet the spec and to turn on. The extra six here is not required. So this six pin, Intel in the spec calls this the extra board connector, and it's required on ATX 12VO power supplies, again like this, that are over 450 watts. And the six pin can be put on anything motherboard wise that needs to hit more than the 288 watt limit of this connector. So that's what gets you the extra overhead. Now these 
connectors, the only reason they'd really be under any power strain is if you had a lot of PCIe slots where each full slot is limited to about 75 watts or uh, 12 volt only. It's typically 66 watts for the 12 volt spec and then the other uh, nine or so comes from the other rails. So the six pin on this, it's physically and electrically identical to a standard PCIe six pin that you would find powering your video card. Nothing new there. And additionally, this in itself isn't really new either because you'll find auxiliary power connectors on motherboards typically for overclocking. So the high end boards where they expect you might run multi GPU, this is more true from ages past. Those will have uh, either a Molex or better case, a PCIe connector somewhere along the bottom or the, the right edge for additional power, specifically so the 24 pin doesn't melt if the PCIe slots are pulling excess power that the 212s can't handle past the 192 watts or so, uh, depending on the gauge of the wire and stuff like that. So that's all somewhat familiar. The last cable or pin out on here that's relevant is that EPS 12 volts, standard eight pin or two by four, uh, I guess technically you do one four and that's identical to the existing EPS 12 volts. So nothing new there. So those three inputs together can supply 960 watts straight into the board, which is way more than enough power for anything realistic to be built. And we think in general that extra six pin is not going to be technically necessary, but you're going to see it on a lot of boards if ATX 12 VO ever gets used, if they're on the higher end side. And the same way you might see two eight pins for EPS 12 volt, even though you probably only need one, it's just, it starts to become associated with the higher end product. But that's how it works. So 960 watts capacity and with the EPS 12 volt still handling the CPU or the bulk of it, that leaves the 10 and possibly the six handling everything else, which really isn't much because you're basically talking about memory, which in general is not that much power. Uh, maybe something like some of these onboard ICs and components, but for the most part, maybe LEDs, things that aren't going to really be pulling anything close to a CPU or a GPU, which are handled more or less by discrete connectors at this point. So uh, even if you had all 75 watts going to each PCIe slot in an instance like this, you're still left with 500 watts of overhead, which is more than sufficient. You could comfortably subtract the additional six pins contribution also and still be left with over 200 watts of headroom. So if the board has the extra connector, there's no real reason to leave it unplugged but it does work without it. We just question why it's being included on a board like this one that's not going to pull that much power in any reasonable scenario. We talked to MSI and asked if there's any reason to use all three and the company had this to say, quote, Intel doesn't mention why EPS 12 volt eight pin is kept, but we think it might be because of protection. CPU is the most power demanding. It's safer to apply protection such as overcurrent uh, independently for CPU and other components. And on the topic of the additional six pin, MSI also said this, quote, for example, a desktop PC, not DIY or notebook, is designed for office use and doesn't require big power. A 10 pin connector is enough in this scenario. But for a board maker, we can't know how consumers will use the Pro H610M 12VO, what devices will be put on the board, so we offer the extra six pin. Now we understand the play it safe mentality here, and that's generally the sort of safer way to go, obviously but it does sort of defeat some of the purpose of reducing the footprint of the ATX 12V non-O spec. So typical, you probably throw the connector on the board to make it look more appealing to users who don't necessarily know what they're looking at. They see this one has 10 plus six, this one has 10, they buy the one with 10 plus six, even though they're gonna socket something into an H610 board that will never need it. And as for after the 12 volts gets converted, uh, it then distributes the power wherever it needs to go. So in the case of SATA, for example, we end up with the connector we mentioned earlier that actually just plugs into this really tiny spot right here. And this actually maybe arguably becomes a worse situation for cable management. Uh, there's probably gonna be cleaner ways to do this, but that is how you would plug in your two and a half inch SSD today. Although NVMe is taking off in such a way that a lot of people are eliminating that cable entirely. But those four pin SATA connectors, they use a four pin version of the same microfit terminals as the PCIe 12 volt high power connector, making them fairly tidy for the board. This four pin is officially rated for two SATA drives, and there's also a six pin version rated for four. We'd prefer to see them moved down near the actual SATA headers because that would make more sense for cable management, 
but that's going to be a board level decision. Those are really the only significant differences between this ATX 12VO board and a standard ATX 12 volt board. Otherwise, everything else is normal. Now, these changes do move some of the cost away from power supplies into the motherboard. So where the power supply might sort of like for like get a little bit cheaper because the conversion is not being done there anymore, you as a consumer are still going to pay for it and they're going to make sure of that. And honestly, if the cost vanished entirely, they'd probably still make sure you pay for it because why would they why would they stop collecting margin on something even if it no longer is part of the product? But in this case, it's absorbed by the motherboard because it now has additional features it needs to accommodate. We talked to MSI about this. MSI said, quote, the cost increase of 12 volt to 5 volt and 12 volt to 3.3 volt circuits is not much. So that's the good news. They said most of the cost is added from bigger PCB size and more layers to accommodate 12 volt to 5 volt and 12 volt to 3.3 volt circuits and components. For ATX boards, the cost is close to non 12 VO since it doesn't require bigger PCB size and more PCB layers. But for micro ATX, it needs a larger micro ATX PCB and six layer PCB compared to four layers being enough for a non 12 VO board. It might cost up to 24% more, mostly from increased PCB size and two more PCB layers. The 24% more is a lot because from a manufacturer perspective, they're not going to charge you 24% more because they paid 24% more. They're going to charge you probably about double of what the cost increase actually was. That's just how the margin typically works for this stuff. So it's not an insignificant change. Now, the only thing positively going for us here is that with the advent of DDR5 and PCIe Gen 5, typically most of these boards are moving away from four layers anyway because the signal integrity just isn't there on a four layer board. They need the additional layers for signaling anyway. And so a lot of that cost is sort of absorbed in a change that they've already had to make. So as quickly as possible then, ATX 12VO has better power efficiency in low power states or extremely low power states when it's like a couple watts for total system draw. That is irrelevant for an individual, but multiplied across millions or hundreds of millions of PCs, if suddenly like a flip of a switch, everybody moved to a higher efficiency ATX 12VO power supply, uh, assuming no cost for getting rid of the old stuff, that would be a more environmentally conscious or power efficient direction to move, which in terms of reducing the impact to the grid, because remember a lot of these changes in spec come not only from Intel, but from government level or federal level contacts, sometimes state level in California, uh, where they are looking at how do we reduce the draw or the load on the actual power grid. That's where a lot of this stuff comes from. So um, obviously there are sort of caveats of, well, if we just instantly invalidate all of these perfectly good power supplies, it's probably actually worse to then have to buy an entirely new product to do the same thing with slightly better power efficiency. But we're not going to get into that discussion today. Uh, there are ways to adapt an existing power supply if you found yourself in possession of a 12VO board that doesn't have a 12V non-O counterpart. It's just they're kind of bulky, the cables, where you end up with, you know, this is just the heat shrink for it, but uh, a PCB this size in the instance of the test one that Corsair made in order to do the 12 VSB adapter. So uh, IPSU percent signaling is probably the most interesting aspect here that could theoretically be extracted and applied to a standard 12 volt power supply, not 12 VO, and be useful for power throttling in instances where you're hitting over power protection rather than just turning off or exploding. The latter of which is much less desirable, although more interesting. Uh, it's questionable if board makers will push the change for DIY. There's lots of industry inertia in the existing ecosystem, the existing spec, and they're not likely to just switch. So you don't need to worry about just suddenly your power supply isn't going to work anymore and you have to buy an adapter cable. Probably this is going to take a very long time. You're more likely to see this in OEM systems and pre-built at a large level like Dell and HP where they build their own motherboard, assuming they don't also just repin a power supply. So uh, for ATX size boards, six plus layer enthusiast stuff, pricing is not really going to change from what we understand. For smaller boards, the pricing will go up uh, because they have to add those extra layers. And board space used is about the same if they have that extra power connector on it, the technically optional one. But if they get rid of it and just run the 10 pin, it is actually much more compact, which could be useful. And then SATA power comes from the motherboard, which makes cable management worse. So that's your recap.
Thanks for watching. Now you're all fully caught up to speed on 12VO. You can check our previous content on it if you want to learn just about the specs, but they've changed a little bit over the last couple of years, so we wanted to revisit it, especially now that we have new parts. And you can go to store.gamersnexus.net to grab a shirt like this one to support us directly, or patreon.com slash gamersnexus. Thanks for watching. We'll see you all next time.